Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. With a joyful heart, we draw living water from the wells of God's salvation. With loud singing, we return to a home of love. With loud shouts, we return to our God. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Today we celebrate the third Sunday of Advent. On these four Sundays leading up to Christmas, we will rejoice in the great gift that is ours in Jesus Christ. As we have said the past two weeks, to help us celebrate, we'll be lighting the candles of the Advent wreath. The candles, as we've said, signify that Jesus is the light of the world, and the evergreens remind us that he is life and brings life to us. All these are arranged in a circle because life in Christ has no end. Each Sunday we will light an additional candle. Then on Christmas Eve we will light all the candles, including the center one, which is the Christ candle. As we do, we will rejoice that Christ has come to us. He is Emmanuel, God with us. Advent is marked by a spirit of joy and celebration. With joyful hearts, we celebrate the coming King. Advent is a time to open our eyes to our many blessings. With joyful hearts, we celebrate the coming King. Advent is a time for, to appreciate the bonds of human love. With joyful hearts, we celebrate. Heaven is a time to remember the promises of God. Today we light three candles. The candle of hope, the candle of peace, and the candle of joy. The light of this third candle reminds us that we have no reason to be fearful or anxious because God has sent us a Savior. We should be glad in this affirmation of God's love for us and blessed to serve Him faithfully with joy-filled hearts.
Let us pray. Gracious God, remind us today and every day that we have good reason to be joyful. And forgive us for focusing our minds on negative things. Because you sent your Son into the world, we can truly celebrate this season of wonder. Fill our hearts with calm assurance so that we might be messengers of peace who joyfully spread your love wherever we go. Amen. Our gospel reading this morning comes from Philippians, the fourth chapter, the fourth through the seventh verses. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now we're going to hear our gospel lesson in just a few minutes as part of my, my uh, sermon. But right now, let us go to the Lord as we lift up our joys and concerns. Let us pray at this time. Heavenly Father, when we think of preparing the way for the coming of your Son into the world, we're tempted to think of the changes that need to be made by and in others. We confess that far too often we overlook the fact that we need to straighten out the rough places of indecision and fill the valleys of doubt that exist in our own lives. Let your Holy Spirit work in us that we may be worthy messengers of your advent. All of these things we ask in the name of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. My message this morning is entitled, What Should We Do? What should we do? You may have noticed the sign on the way in that announces the, the sermon, and there's no question mark after it because I just simply could not find a question mark to go at the end of that. But trust me, it's there. What should we do? <clears throat> now, three-year-old Gracie was playing in the living room, testing things out. And her mother saw her pick up a nickel and examine it, and then all of a sudden she swallowed it. Now, Mother immediately picked her up, turned her upside down, and pounded her on her back, whereupon Gracie coughed up two dimes. <laughs> two dimes. <clears throat> now, when that happened, the mother really got worried. Hysterically, she shouted to her husband, who was out in the backyard, Gracie just swallowed a nickel and coughed up two dimes. Hurry, tell me what to do. The father shouted back, keep feeding her nickels, we can use the money. <laughs> the world around us constantly tells us we're not worth very much. Big business practices seem to agree. We're only worth as much as they can get out of us. But the biblical estimate of a single person's worth is beyond human comprehension. On the very first page, the Bible says that we're created in God's image. We're the creation of a God who loves us so much, values us so highly, that he sent his only son to die on the cross so that we can live. Now, through Jesus Christ, God became one of us in order to tell us in the most dramatic way possible just how much God loves and treasures us. And that's what this birth in Bethlehem we celebrate every year is about. That's what the Christmas tree and the decorations are about. We celebrate the gift God gave us by giving gifts to our loved ones. But no gift 
will ever come close to what God has given us in Christ. John came as a prophet proclaiming the coming of Christ the Messiah. He was the commercial announcing this event. He was the warm-up act, so to speak. John came to wake people up to the fact that the time wasn't just coming, the time was here. And now, <clears throat> as you're able, I'm going to ask you to do something just a little bit different. I'm going to ask that you please rise as you're able for the reading of the gospel. Please stand as you are able. Our gospel reading this morning comes from the third chapter of the uh, book of Luke, the 7th through the 18th verses. John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones God can raise up children, for Abraham the axe is already at the root of the trees and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire what should we do then the crowd asked John answered anyone who has two shirts should share with the one who has none and anyone who has food should do the same even tax collectors came to be baptized teacher they asked what should we do don't collect any more than you're required to, he told them. Then some soldiers asked him, and what should we do? And he replied, don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. The people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Messiah. John answered them all, I baptize you with water. But one who is more powerful than I will come, the straps of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. And he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing room and to gather the wheat into his barn. But he'll burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And with many other words, John exhorted the people and proclaimed the good news to them. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Please be seated. Now John proclaimed the good news. People heard it, received it, and asked, what should we do? What should we do? And that's a pertinent question for today. What should we do? Now let's look at a portion of the answer this morning. What should we do? First, we should participate. We should participate. Now, how do we participate? Well, it's very simple. Make sure in the midst of the busyness of getting your house and your business in order that you save time and room to get your heart and your spirit ready. Those are the most important parts of who we are that need to be made ready. Make sure that you worship at every opportunity between now and Christmas. Come next Sunday and support the choir when it presents the cantata. Give of yourself through your attendance as they give themselves to you and God through their presentation. You'll be lifted up by the message of the season as it's shared through song. And if possible, come to the longest night service and the Christmas Eve candlelight communion service and bring someone you care about with you Help them to participate as well. Use your upper room disciplines or your upper room or other devotional books. They'll touch your heart and keep your focus on the real reason for the season. If you haven't felt like you've gotten to do anything charitable giving this year, then give to the bell ringers for the Salvation Army. Carry extra quarters and dollars to drop into their buckets. Send an anonymous Christmas card with a little cash, perhaps, to a family you know that's in need. What should we do? Participate. Participate. Now, the second thing that we should do is to persist. To persist. 
Now, often this time of year causes us a great deal of stress, doesn't it? There's so much to do, so many places to go, so many things to buy that it gets old quick, and we begin to lose that spirit of Christmas. I heard a story about a woman who was out Christmas shopping with her two children. And after hours of looking at row after row of toys and everything else imaginable, she was exhausted and she was frustrated. All of that was made worse by the fact that both of her children kept asking for everything they saw on the shelves. She finally made it to the elevator with her two kids. She felt what we all feel during the holiday season. She felt overwhelmed by the pressure to go to every party, every housewarming, prepare all the traditional holiday food and treats, to get the perfect gift for every single person on her shopping list, and to make sure she didn't forget anyone on her card list. She groaned inwardly as the elevator doors opened and there was already a crowd in the elevator. She pushed her way into the car and she dragged her two kids in with her and all the bags and all the stuff. And when the doors closed, she couldn't take it anymore and stated, whoever started this whole Christmas thing should be found, strung up, and shot. Now from the back of the car, everyone heard a quiet, calm voice respond, don't worry, we already crucified him. For the rest of the trip down the elevator, it was so quiet you could have heard a pin drop. This year, we need to persist. We need to remember the one who started this whole Christmas thing. We need to keep him and his purpose, both in the world and in our lives, in our every thought, in our every deed, in our every purchase, and in our every word. If we all did that, can you imagine just how different how different this whole world would be. What should we do? We should persist. Participate, persist. And finally, pursue. Pursue Christmas. Don't give up until you've experienced the joy of Christmas. Now the founder of Methodism, John Wesley, kept a diary. Listen to some of the entries from that journal. Sunday a.m., May 5th, preached at St. Anne's, was asked not to come back anymore. I can relate to that. Sunday p.m., <laughs> May 5th, preached at St. John's, deacon said, get out and stay out. Sunday a.m., May the 12th, preached in St. Jude's, cannot go back there either. Sunday a.m., May 19th, preached in St. Somebody Else's. Deacons called a special meeting and said, I could not return. Sunday p.m., May 19th, preached on street, kicked off street. Wow. Sunday a.m., May 26th, preached in Meadow, chased out of Meadow as bull was turned loose during service. Sunday a.m., June 2nd, preached out at the edge of town, kicked off the highway. Sunday p.m., June the 2nd, afternoon, preached in a pasture. 10,000 people came out to hear me. Old John sure went through a lot to find satisfaction in his ministry. How far are you willing to go to make the miracle of Christmas come alive? How far are you willing to go to reap the promise of Christmas, to behold the wonder of Christmas, to receive the greatest gift ever given? Pursue, pursue Christmas with that same excitement as the wise men. What should we do? Pursue. Now, Mark Connolly, in his classic play, Green Pastures, imagines the angel Gabriel approaching God who is in deep thought. God is troubled about what's happening on the earth. He's troubled because he has sent his prophets and his messengers, but the people on earth refuse to even listen to him. Gabriel, seeing God's hurt, reacts in anger. 
He offers to blow the final trumpet and to end the whole thing. But the Lord removes Gabriel's horn from his lips, determined to try to what yet one more time. But isn't this all routine? Gabriel wants to know. Can't we already predict the result? God says, I'm not going to send anybody this time. I'm going myself. And that's the story of Advent. That's what we're preparing for, to celebrate God entering into our lives and our world in the form of an innocent child. What should we do? What should we do? Participate, persist, and pursue Christmas this year. Amen.
benediction. To be a joy bearer and a joy giver says everything. For in your life, if one is joyful, it means that one is faithfully living for God. And if one gives joy to others, one is doing God's work with joy without and joy within all is well. Go now and do God's joyful work. 